Okay. Uh, welcome everybody, this is Velia Museo on Air. Uh, I am Valeria and today we are going to talk about um, team-based and visitor center exhibition development with Silvia Filippini Fantoni, uh, which is the Director of Interpretation, Media and Evaluation at the Indianapolis Museum of Art. Hello Silvia, thank you to be here. Hello everybody. And from the Italian side, we have Cristina Casadei, uh, Communication and Project Manager at the Carlo Zauli Museum in Faenza. Hello, Cristina. Ciao. Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, Alessandra and Francesca as well. Hi. Ciao. Okay. Ciao. So today we're going to talk about the case of the Indianapolis Museum of Art, uh, which has started a rather revolutionary approach in uh, exhibition development. So instead of a top-down approach, the uh, exhibition are uh, discussed and created um, by a number of representatives of the different facets of the museum. So um, instead of only curators, we have uh, educators and uh, interpretation specialists and communicators and evaluators and so on. Um, and we're going to, um, Sylvia is going to talk about how this is uh, working out for the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And um, we picked um, rather uh, different uh, topic than uh, the the ones that we talk about usually, uh, just because we think that this is a, a representative case of a new ways of thinking and um, a new ways in which museum can face uh, the challenges of the contemporary society, contemporary uh, questions uh, to remain rele relevant with the public. So we can start, I think, Sylvia. Yes, okay. absolutely. Let me share the presentation again. And here it is, yes. Okay, so first of all, thank you for the introduction. And yes, the focus today of the presentation will be about what I call here the museum outside in. So instead of a top-down approach, it's really a bottom-up approach. So understanding our audience, who they are, what they want, understanding who doesn't come to the museum and why, and then develop experience that serve our audience but also are useful to attract new audiences to the museum. And uh, our new exhibition development project is really, process is really part of this general attempt of our museum to be more visitor-centered. Now, just for those of you who don't know, um, anything about the Indianapolis Museum of Art, which I think might be the case for almost uh, all of you. Um, this is a, a museum that it's located in um, the middle of nowhere, pretty much, in a state called Indiana, the capital of the state is Indianapolis. So this is uh, in um, exactly the red spot that you see there on the map in, in the Midwest of the United States. Um, it's actually quite a large museum. Uh, we have an interesting collection of about 55,000 work of art from different periods and different times and different geographical areas. So we have African art, Asian art, European art, uh, contemporary art, contemporary design. Um, we also actually, uh, we have a large campus, it's not just a museum. Um, we also have a, an historic house, you see a photo there, it's a house that was, is built on the campus, um, the campus was originally the gardens of the house, this was built at the beginning of the um, 20th century. Um, so we also arrange visits at the house. People can uh, can see the house and understand and learn about the history of uh, the people that lived there, which was a very prominent family in Indianapolis, uh, which then donated the house and the grounds to the museum. We also have beautiful gardens, um, the gardens of the house, the gardens of the museum, but also we have a 100 acres contemporary park with different installation and sculpture developed by contemporary artists specifically for the park. So people can hang out in there. Uh, everything essentially in a museum is free, so we have a uh, free access. The only exceptions are temporary, certain temporary exhibition for which we charge um, admission. Um, so this is, gives you a little bit of a review of what the Indianapolis Museum of Art is. Now, um, recently there has been a shift at the museum, a shift that, um, you know, um, has been, is the result of a new director coming to the museum with a slightly different vision, but it's also the result of, you know, changes that we've seen, as Valeria mentioned, in our society recently. Um, you know, people are 
expectations are changed. There's a lot more competition from other different leisure time activity, technology, the internet. In a city like Indianapolis, we have competition from especially sports events. It's a very sport-oriented town. So it was getting different, more and more difficult to attract audience to our institution. Um, also, um, we had financial considerations, you know, with the economic crisis. You know, we are a private museum. We do not have uh, public funding here. We do have an endowment, which is obviously invested, and then we use um, we use part of the interest that we um, gain from the investment of this endowment uh, to you know to survive. And also, we uh, rely on fundraising and uh, development. Um, but um, it is you know it. In a situations of economic crisis, obviously our resources became smaller and smaller. So it became important that we looked at the visitors and tried to get more people to the museum and try to serve our audience better so that these people continued to come and also make the experience here more, more sustainable. Uh, another important reason why we sort of recently changed our perspective and became more visitor-centered is also because we realized that it was very important to the mission of the institution. In order to educate about art, to engage people with art, we need to keep in more into consideration who they are and how they learn and how they spend their time and what they do and how they visit and why they come so that we can develop experience that can serve a little bit their, their needs um, better. So these are the reasons why uh, you know we've recently kind of shifted a little bit towards a more visitor-centered approach. This visitor-centered approach is mainly characterized by three aspects. Um, one is the implementation of a new exhibition development model that I will discuss um, soon. The second is the creation of an audience research and evaluation team. So we're starting doing a lot of research and evaluation with the visitors and I'm going to talk, if there is time, I'm going to talk a little bit about it because it's also very important within the exhibition development model that we have implemented. And also, we've started to develop participatory projects that engage our audience. You know, they come to the museum and we provide all sorts of platforms for them to express themselves, to express their creativity, and also to share their creations with other people. We want the museum to, to feel like a space where people can um, feel like they have a voice. And so, um, if we have time, I will also provide some examples of projects that we have, um, we have developed. Let's start with the new exhibition development process. Um, this process is new for us, is new for art museum, it is not new for other museums. So we do have, this is like science museum, children's museum, science center, I've been using this model for many, many years. But for some reason it has been very difficult for art museum to move towards this type of approach. So I don't want you to think that we have created this from nothing. It's based on experiences of other non-art museums and also it's based on the experience of other pioneering art museums that have started adapting this model to an art museum. And these, these pioneering art museums in the United States are the Detroit Institute of Art, the Denver Museum of Art, Oakland uh, Museum of California, I think it's called. These are some of the Brooklyn Museum of Art. These are some of the museums that have really started um, using a very similar project process. And we, um, at, together with these institutions, um, are some of the first sort of you know adopters of this approach. What is this approach? So, up until about one year ago, the exhibition development was very much a curator affair. So the curator would come up with the idea, would do research, would identify some objects that they would like to display in the exhibition, they would think about how to organize them in the space, they would write the content, they will talk a little bit about the designers to make sure that what, what they wanted to do was possible, and then at the end of the process sometimes they would come to an educator or, uh, or an interpretation specialist and say, oh, we have some money, is there something interesting that we can do? And that had to be done kind of towards at the end of the project when everything else was already kind of decided. Um, we um, now um, do have a very different pro process. Um, and these are kind of the principle of this process. So this process is collaborative. So from the start, we have at the table a representative of the various departments. So we have a curators, we have interpretation specialists, we have a, um, evaluation specialists, and particularly evaluation and interpretation are the people that represent the audience at the table. Then we have a designer, 
We also have um, a person that sort of is in charge of the logistic and installation aspects of the exhibition. At points within the, the process, we also bring in people that are in charge of programming, of events, and of communication so that, you know, everything is, um, you know, um, homogeneous in a way. So the important thing is that we have a team and the team works together to define the exhibition from the start. And the important thing is that as part of this team, we have two representative, at least two, representative of the visitors. So two people that are there because they represent the voice of the visitors at the table. So that whatever we develop, it's something that is easy for people to understand, easy for people to use, fun and engaging. And that's kind of the idea. We, you know, sometimes exhibitions tend to be very conceptual and more academic, and we want to try to make them a little bit more approachable. Uh, from our audience, especially in a city like Indianapolis, where you know we we do not have a huge you know number of specialists of art uh, or art lovers, so populations here are more interested in other things. So um, we really need to you know be more considerate of that. Now, um, the um, one of the most important things that we do. Uh, as part of the process is when we create this team of visitors, one of the first things that we do is we create a document. This document is called the big idea. Sometimes um, exhibitions, um, curators develop exhibitions for many years, they do a lot of research, so there's a lot of information uh, around these topics that they want to communicate to the public. But um, And so sometimes it happens that whenever you implement something, there's too much going on and there's too much that is said, it's too much that is communicated. So we want to help them kind of narrow it down and think more strategically, what are the most important things that you want to communicate to your visitors? So we create a document that it becomes really our um, our point of reference for everything in the exhibition. And this project, com document is called a big idea. And the big idea is something that uh, contains very much a description of the main thesis of the exhibition in one sentence. You need to be able to express the main point of your show in one sentence. Okay? And then based on that, we also identify what we call learning outcomes, which is what else do you want people to take away from that experience of the visitors. So we identified four or five other points, subject, issue, value um, that we want people to take away from the experience. Sometimes it's factual information, but sometimes it's a development of a positive attitude towards something or changing people's perspective on something. So it doesn't necessarily mean that an outcome is learning something factual. Sometimes an outcome is about changing people's perspective, changing people's point of view. Okay, so we have this document, and I'm going to show you an example because I, I can't. Th I think that it can be a little abstract uh, when we talk about um, this. So we are working now on the development of a Georgia O'Keeffe uh, exhibition. It's actually Georgia O'Keeffe and this and um, other artists that worked in the Southwest, and um, it's on the topic of still lifes. Okay, so. This is exactly on the screen. You see now what the big idea for the exhibition is. So we summarize this in one sentence, well, two sentences, to be perfectly honest. But um, so the idea of the exhibition is that artists that lived in the Southwest uh, and created some still life were able to create still life that were somewhat evocative of the place where they lived. You know, when you look at still life from other artists, from Picasso to Cezanne to other American artists like Chase, you do not have a sense, you know, this, this could have been made everywhere, somewhere in Europe or in America, but there is nothing specific about the place. While in the Southwest, we, we see um, that these artists, you know, use elements of Southwestern culture, Southwestern flowers, Southwestern architecture, colors of the Southwest. So these still life become a way to represent a place. And that is the main concept of the exhibition. And that's something that we have there in one sentence or two sentences. And it's very clear that this is our main message. Okay. After that, we have some learning outcomes. These are the learning outcomes here, for instance. So other ideas that we want. the early 20th century of um, artists traveling to the Southwest. So better understanding this phenomenon, so there will be part of the experience of the exhibition that will address this. We want people to better understand Southwestern culture, so through the objects and the architectural elements and uh, the flowers and the desert bones that are represented here, we want them to understand better 
Southwestern culture. We also want people to understand how different artists approach the same topics, the same still life, in very different ways stylistically. So we do a lot of comparison. And also, we want to. One thing that we did is that we did a study on this, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. But um, one thing that came back when we discussed with visitors the idea of this exhibition is that people were absolutely crazily interested in Bad O'Keefe. O'Keefe was really something that they was they were very interested in. They wanted to know more about her, why she came to the Southwest, uh, what her relationship with other artists in the Southwest was, her relationship with Stieglitz. So we have built all this information as well into um, the outcome. And finally, the, out, the last outcome is defining, uh, getting people the idea that the notion of still life is something that it's a little bit beyond the general understanding that people have of inanimate objects. There are different sort of interpretation of it, and we will see a lot of examples of this in the exhibition. So we create a document that really, really defines what are the main points and messages that we want people to take away from the experience. And then we use this as a reference for the development of everything development of our interpretation plan, development and content, development of applications, development of layout, and development of design. Everything needs to be supporting these stories that we want to tell. Okay, so this, this, this is our Bible for the exhibition. Okay, and the important thing, and so I'm going to go back here uh, to the previous slide, the important thing is that this Bible is very useful because it offers us a way to evaluate whether we were successful in telling those stories or not. So when we do an evaluation at the end of the exhibition, and I will show example, what we look at, we don't, only, we don't only look at how many people come, who they are, why they came, were they satisfied or not, but also have this outcome been met? Were we able to express some con these concepts successfully and were people able to understand and learn? So they offer really a new parameter for defining the success of the exhibition. And um, the last element of the um, exhibition development process is the importance of incorporating evaluation and testing at every step of the way in the development process. So we do it all the time. And I will show you tons of examples of how we do it before we even start conceptualizing the exhibition to help us refining the, need, the idea of the exhibition, and then at the end to see whether we have been successful or not. So it's constant, the importance of constantly incorporating the visitors directly into the exhibition development process, not just through representative like myself or my colleague here, but also through by going to visitors and ask them questions, ask them what they think about things, ask, ask them if what we develop is something that it's easy for them to use. So this is a very important aspect of our process. Okay. So, um, and why do we do this? Why do we do this? Well, we, want, we do it because, as I said before, we want to make our exhibition more accessible to visitors, to all visitors, also people that have very little understanding of art and art history. Uh, we want people to engage with not only the artworks more, but also with the institution and in improve their understanding of art. We want to create better experience to increase their satisfaction, make sure that they come back. But also we want to attract new audiences um, to, to the museum. And with some of these experiences, we will see how we um, really uh, were geared towards trying to get younger audience to the museum, which can be some challenges sometimes. Um, I don't want to go, I, I put some slides here, you can, I'll share this, this with you guys afterwards. I don't want to go too much, spend too much time uh, looking at the details, but I try to kind of visualize a little bit the process. And this is a very big simplification of what the process is. It's a lot more complicated than that, but I just thought that it, it, it would help. So this is the proposal process. Even when exhibitions are proposed, we go through a process of approval that sometimes implies, as you see in yellow here, evaluation with visitors. You know, I'm going to give you an example later of an exhibition where we had two, three different ideas of where this exhibition could go, and we tested the ideas with visitors, and then visitors had a very, very, very positive response to one idea in particular, and so we decided to go in that direction. Sometimes we choose also not to do what visitors necessarily prefer, but in this case it was really the purpose of the exhibition was to attract a specific kind of audience, and that audience responded very well to one concept in particular, so we decided to go for that concept, and I will show you the example more specifically later. So the idea is that a curator comes up with an idea, it could be anybody else in a museum, but generally the curators are the one coming up with an idea, 
or proposing an exhibition that comes from somewhere else. Sometimes that happens as well. Um, they propose it to a committee that evaluates it. Sometimes the committee says, okay, um, sure, let's just go ahead and start developing it. Sometimes they say, well, let's do some testing. And so um, this is what happens. Sometimes we go to the visitors and ask them the questions and then come back and, and sort of report back. And then the committee decides whether we want to pursue this or change it or not. If this decision is to pursue and continue with the development of the exhibition, we create the core team. So the core team um, is the group of people that work together on developing the, I, the big idea for the exhibition. Okay. So before, um, and this is kind of the proposal process. Afterwards, once we have, once the group starts meeting, we start coming up and defining the big idea. We define the learning outcomes. And then we go out and test those again with the visitors. So we uh, do another evaluation where we show them some works of art that we want to show in the exhibition. We show them a little brief, this, the, the big idea. And then we ask people questions about, you know, what do you think when you see these works? What would you be interested in finding out? We, give, we show them examples of what we would like to discuss. And then we collect feedback this way. And then we adjust the big idea and learning outcome according to the feedback that visitors give us. We don't completely redo everything, but sometimes we add a theme that we didn't think about because people seem very very responsive to that idea and I will show you an example later as well once we have the big idea document uh, and the learning outcomes we create the interpretation plan so I'm going to show you a little bit of how this looks like which is essentially it's an Excel sheet where on the right you know the first column is the list of the big idea and learning outcomes okay on the row at the top we have the different interpretation tools that we want to use to tell uh, to to in the exhibition labels didactic visuals photos videos ipads application right, activities and then we map them we see okay this outcome how can we address it sometimes there is overlap so one outcome is addressed with multiple tools because we can't expect that people will use all the tools. So we need to make sure that the story is told and people get it, even though, for instance, they don't use the audio guide because not everybody uses the audio guide. So we try to map it. So everything that we do is very deliberate because it, we need to make sure that the concept is expressed in multiple ways. Uh, and then maybe certain kind of concepts are better for one interpretation tools than for others. For instance, we want to do video. We, we think that certain kind of concepts are better expressed through video. So that means that those will be uh, made available on iPads that we um, uh, that we um, install in the exhibition. So we um, we map everything like this so that we have a general idea of what we're doing. So everything is the, as a purpose. After we do this, we um, sorry, we I'm going back. We uh, finalize the checklist, so we find we look at the work of art. Do we have everything? Shall we add more work of art that help us to better tell another story? That is one of our outcomes. Once that is finalized, we do the exhibition layout. So we meet all together. We have a model of the exhibition space, and then we start, you know, putting in the various objects. We start putting in the interpretation, you know. And we map it in the space. We have a meeting all together. Yesterday we had two meetings for two exhibitions to do this exercise, which is actually a very, very fun exercise. So we all meet and all discuss. And the important thing is that the interpretation tools here are not added as an afterthought, but they're integrated from the beginning into the space because they are placed in there together with the artwork at the same time. Does it make sense so far? OK. Um, after the LA, LA exhibition layout is done, then we start the content development, the application development, and then the graphic design. Sometimes we have design elements, visual elements in the exhibition, and so we have to design them. So it's really the content development process. And we have different type of contents. Um, and at every stage of the content development process, again, whether it's text, or whether it's audiovisual, or whether it's participatory experience, as you can see, there is the yellow box, which means that at every step, we still go back and talk to the visitors when we develop the content. I'm going to give you two examples. For instance, we had um, to develop a video. We had an exhibition about printmaking, a, a, a printmaker, um, well, actually an artist. His name is Robert Indiana. He's a pop artist, but he also um, produced a lot of prints of his paintings. 
and the exhibition focused on his prints. And um, we um, decided that we wanted to talk about the printmaking process. And the best way to do it was to uh, record a video of visitors. Um, um, I recorded videos of the process. So we went to the local art school. They do have a printmaking classes, and we recorded a video of people creating uh, a print from the start. And we, you know, we edited it together, and then we showed it to. We put it on an iPad, and we went into the galleries, and we showed it to ten people, and um, and then I got their feedback. Did do you understand the process based on this video? Is it too long? Is there any wording in this video that's complicated? And then we 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 adapted it a little bit accordingly. So as you see, even in the exhibition in the content development process, we do go back to the visitors and consult to the visitors, particularly when it comes to creating hands-on and interactive experiences. The testing of the visitor is very important, and we do often it twice, once in the design phase and once in the development stages. As you can see, it's um, you have two boxes here. So this is a little bit the process that we, that we developed, um, that we have now used, you know, we introduced this one year ago. And so we've used it for three exhibitions that have now opened to the public. And then we have two more that are in the development stages of the exhibition. And then we have three more that are in the proposal stages. So it seems like, you know, the process is going fairly well. And that the plan is to continue adopting it in the future. The process is not without challenges, though. Um, and um, you know, one of the biggest difficulties that we've had was that we had um, a lot of resistance um, to the process. Uh, mostly, I have to be honest, from curatorial staff. They um, are used to a certain way of doing things, having full control of the exhibition development process. And this was something that they you know, felt uncomfortable with. It's completely understandable. Um, the two main fear that they have, um, besides sort of control, is really the idea, they are afraid that by thinking too much about the visitors and, and taking the visitors too much into consideration, the academic soundness of the exhibition is compromised and that the exhibition in English we use this expression called dumbing down, dumbed down. So it's kind of, you know, diluted a little bit. So this is one of their concern. And the other concern is um, uh, obviously we are bringing interpretation tool a lot more into the exhibition. They are a lot more integrated in the space as a result of this process. So they are afraid that these things will distract from the experience of the visitors. So far evaluation has actually proven that this is absolutely not the case and that people actually not only um, you know spend more time with the art as a result of you know having all these tools but also people are um, you know learning a lot more the messages that we are communicating we are communicating them more effectively however you know this fear is still somewhat present even though people start feeling a little bit more comfortable now that we have done a few exhibitions the other problem is not only resistance from the inside but is resistance from the outside so what happens is that some of the exhibitions that we do we do not develop them ourselves from scratch we get them from other museums but we still try to adapt them a little bit so that they serve better the need of our audience, which is different. You know, if a museum comes, let's say, from the Met or from the Tate or from a museum in California, their audience is different than, uh, you know, the audience of a city like Indianapolis, which is kind of a more regional, you know, um, audience. Um, so we want to try to adapt this exhibition, and there is a lot of resistance um, on, uh, from other institutions. The process is also, honestly, more time consuming. There's a lot of meetings, you know, uh, sometimes uh, coming to a compromise is very difficult. People have different point of view, different perspectives. So it takes a lot of time to, uh, you know, um, to get consensus on things. So these are somewhat the challenges that, the, the, and sometimes it's hard when you have limited resources, you know, to, 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 to use all this time to kind of to mediate um, and to meet. But um, to me, the benefits surpass by far the challenges. So I think it's important that we continue in this direction. What are the benefits that we have seen so far? We um, compare, we have a, an increase of visitor satisfaction in the past three exhibitions compared to previous exhibitions. So people are actually more satisfied with the experience. We have collected data about visitor satisfaction in exhibition for the past two and a half years. So we do have data to compare it to previous exhibition models, and we see that there is a higher satisfaction. As I said before, um, we have new way of measuring success because we can measure whether the learning outcome have been met, 
And what we're seeing is that sometimes we have 95% of the people that do mention the big idea when we interview them on their own terms after the visit, which means that we have been successful in communicating that message. Um, another thing is, which is a result of this is that we have a better integration and higher usage of interpretive tool and participatory experiences because they are integrated in the exhibition. Before they were there sometimes, but they were outside in a little corner, hidden away. Now they are there and they're in your face, so people use them and not only, sometimes people don't use them, but they do appreciate um, the experience anyway so even if they don't participate themselves they do see what other people make and create and they they look at those things and they think oh this is really cool I really like the fact that you know we give the opportunity for people to express themselves and be creative so these are um, a little bit um, sort of um, this is kind of our experience with uh, with this new process and I just have some images here I um, this is an example of how an exhibition looked like two years ago so this is, you know, it's, it's good. I'm not saying that this is not good. Our designers are fantastic. Um, but mostly it's works of art with labels. The more interactive experience that we had in the space was a re little reading area. This is how exhibitions look now. So this is um, an exhibition by Robert Indiana. Uh, obviously, we have people looking at art, and, and that's the most important uh, part of it still. But we do have a lot of different type of content, type of experiences. We have participatory activities. We have a lot more integrated into the exhibition. And also, as you see, the type of people that are coming is changing. We can start seeing younger audiences and families coming in because now people start to kind of understand that we offer this experience so they come back and they bring their families. So this is a little bit um, you know what what we do. Um, we, I've, we're already you know at half an hour so probably we should finish here but I want to let you know that um, in the next slides once I share it um, there's a little bit more about um, audience research and evaluation, an example of how we have uh, carried it out at various steps of the development process so that you can see sort of how in, in, it is important to integrate this into the experience. And then I'm, I also have, um, at the end, I also have examples of participatory experiences that we have developed for our audience. So example of projects related to exhibition in which visitors were able to create something whether it's a work of art or share an opinion, share a memory in the exhibition space. Here, for instance, in the photo, and it's a very simple example that I maybe should close with, um, is um, for the Robert Indiana exhibition. So Robert Indiana, this artist, is, is a pop artist. So um, he uses kind of flashy color words, the sort of interesting shapes in his works. But all of these shapes, colors, and um, words, they have a very autobiographical nature. So they tell, there's a story behind, and you know, an association with his mother, with something that happened in his life when he was young. So what we ask people to do, we ask them to express their own personal association. So what is what with certain colors, with certain shapes, with certain um, um, words or numbers, for instance, you know, what was their favorite number and why, uh, who what is their favorite color and why. And so we had this entire wall where people put up cards with, you know, sharing their personal memories and associations with these things, which was very successful. We had like thousands and thousands of cards that were, that were um, created by visitors. So it, it can, you know, a participatory experience can be something very, very simple and basic like this. Or it can be something more more complex. Like for instance, this is the one that we have, um, uh, you know, um, developed. Sorry, um, I'm just gonna go fast here. But um, this is something that we currently have for our uh, exhibition. We have an exhibition about neo impressionism or pointillism, um, and we have developed an application. Uh, so this is high tech. Um, so far, so called high tech that allows people to take a photo of themselves and then turn it into a neo-impressionist 
portrait. So people can apply a filter, select the size of the dots that they want to apply. They can select different color effects. They can sign the portrait and then they can share it on their Facebook page or they can email it to themselves. And then we project these um, ones outside the exhibition where people then can take a photo of themselves in front of the pointillist portrait of themselves which they have made, which is something that people are loving. We have 70% of our visitors in the exhibition doing this activity. So this is huge. So this is just to give you an idea of the different type of, you know, some activities are very low tax, some activities are more high tax, some activities are, um, you know, but all of these activities, the most important thing to consider is that they always there to support a learning outcomes. You know, so this is kind of a little bit what we do. Yeah. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for um, sharing this presentation. Um, I think we have a couple of questions, also from Twitter. Um, Let me just close okay. the presentation for a second. Yes. OK, perfect. Okay. Sure. Shall, shall I go with the Twitter question first? Yeah. Okay, so we have a question from Zio, Zio Gianetti, and they're asking uh, whether you use like always the same group of people, of visitors, to ask them uh, like to run the surveys, or whether it is more, more random. As you said, you mentioned that the, the test with the video to random visitors, so I don't know, maybe you already answered the, this question, but we wonder how, in, more in general, how the, you run these, uh, these surveys and I mean if you, you said that you run surveys before, during and after the process, so how, how are the, how are these survey run and which kind of surveys are them, like just video or also question? Yeah, uh, it's, it's a little bit wonky. Uh, okay. It's okay. Yeah, well, uh, you, you got the question, I think. I got the question. I'm actually going to go back to the okay. presentation, if you don't mind, because right. actually um, it might be useful to um, show some, some some kind of example. Is that okay? I, I kind of did not. Are you guys seeing the presentation now? Yes. Yes. Um, sorry, let me just go back. Oh, give me. Why is this not working? Oh. Come on. Technology. Okay. Okay, so yes, we um, we there is a way. Sometimes you can have a panel of visitors and create the beginning of the exhibition, and then work with them throughout the entire process. So you go back. You have like ten people, and you ask them the initial question, then you start developing things, and you can go back to them, um, ask them more questions, and then you develop more stuff, and then go back. So there are situations in which you can have a panel of visitors, and then you involve them throughout the whole process. We have not really done this. We um, choose visitors more randomly for our um, studies. Um, randomly, sometimes we need a specific type of audience, like families or younger visitors. So we obviously target those. But generally, the selection is um, is done more um, more randomly. Now we. Um, don't only consult with people that come physically to the museum. So the easiest way to do evaluation and to do feed and to get feedback is you go out in the galleries and you just talk to people. We do that all the time. We you know it's, it doesn't have to be very structured. You know we know uh, we prepare a little you know list of questions. We prepare some props that we show them, but it doesn't have to be you know something that you prepare for three months and then it takes three months to write a report about. No, it's very something very quick. Um, sometimes we also want to talk to people that don't come to the museum necessarily because the idea is that these experiences should attract new visitors. So we do surveys, for instance, on um, and we use a Survey Monkey. I don't know if anybody um, is aware of this tool. Um, survey Monkey is you know it's not the best thing in the world, but it's very it's relatively cheap and it gives us the flexibility of doing more or less what we want. And, uh, and we use it not only to do surveys with our um, audience here internally, we have emails of our visitors, emails of our members, but we also purchase some email from SurveyMonkey. Uh, they have a number of email addresses in the area of Indianapolis. 
so we purchased these and so we were able to reach in visitors that do not people that do not necessarily come to the museum so this is something that kind of allow us this flexibility on the screen now you have an example of a study that I was talking about before this was in the conceptual phases of the exhibition um, so we at these four ideas for a car um, exhibition. Uh, it's, it's about car design. In a city like Indianapolis, which is famous for the Indy 500 uh, race, and a lot of people are interested in car. And cars are design objects. So we, we thought, well, it's a good way to get those people people that do not um, necessarily come to a museum and have an interest in, in car and sports. So we thought, let's do an exhibition about this, but we had four different ideas. So what we did, we, um, we wrote a little description, we choose some images, and we created an online survey, and we sent it to a bunch of people, some members, some visitors, and some non-visitors. And then, you know, uh, we got some feedback, and uh, the, the idea that really was successful with visitors, especially younger visitors and male, which was the people that we wanted to attract, was this idea of concept cars. So one-of-a-kind cars that are developed more for testing ideas and design ideas than for actual production. And so that's what we're going to do. So this is kind of an example. And in this case, we used a survey. Uh, in other examples, here is an example of a focus group. So this is something, again, that we did in the early stages of development of um, a space. This is our family activity area in the exhibition. This is a space where we have a number of activity. People can come in. They can create things. They can play. They can draw things on iPads. They can take a photo of what they made and then share it with the other with other people. So we have different type of activities here. And when we we came up with a number of ideas for these activities and then we we um, had a focus group so we created prototypes of those ideas and then we invited 20 families to come to different session and then play let them play with each of the activity that we had in mind and then we had a little chat with uh, with them in small groups and then we collected feedback and then we implemented some of the ideas and we did not implement others because people didn't didn't really like some of them so this was really really useful um, we have surveys at the exit of the exhibition, we do interviews with our visitors, but we also do observation. Observation is another important element. Um, so we follow people in the exhibition. So what the first thing we do is that we map the space. So this is an example of an alien exhibition, um, where we map the position of every object, every label that we had in the space, and every other tool. And then we follow 30 to 40 people. We mark where they stop how long they stop at each and then we do an analysis of the information like for instance here what we learned for this study we learned that people um, reach the peak in the gallery number two so in gallery number two they had the highest number of um, uh, work of, they looked at the highest number of work of art for the longest time and they read the highest number of labels and then from then on it started going downhill and particularly we had a drop after gallery five and this showed us the were far too much content and far too many objects in the exhibition because at, at, in gallery five people reached fatigue and so we saw them you know paying less attention to everything so that helps us a little bit the curator put the most important artist in the last gallery and this showed her that it was a very bad idea just to give you a sense of sort of the different things that, that we do so yeah does that answer the question yes perfectly thank you it was I really cannot hear you Okay, uh, <laughs> I have problems with my okay. connection, maybe. Can you hear me, Sylvia? Yeah, yes, okay. I can. Okay. Cool. Uh, yes, I think it answered the question. There is another one, uh, Alessandro? Yes, yes. And based on which metrics you think that this approach is working, like is it the number of visitors that are coming to the museum or comments, reviews or tickets sold? And other to this, what is the future of this model according to you? Where is the museum heading toward? Okay, so um, measuring the metrics of success. Um, first of all, I mentioned um, well, there's a different aspects. Attendance, satisfaction, and um, learning outcomes. So these are, would say, the three main aspects of things. Um, um, attendance, we have had one year of experience. And I can tell you that the last three exhibitions have had the highest number of visitors compared to the you know, past, previous two, three years, even for going back in the fourth year. 
I don't want to take full ownership <laughs> of that in the sense that obviously it also depends on the topic. One of these exhibitions was a very popular topic, Matisse. And we had a lot of marketing dollars <laughs> in it. So, um, experiences, and then they come back. So it might take a little time to kind of measure steady increase of attendance. We do. We have witnessed it in the past year, but I I don't know at this stage whether it's exactly the direct result of that or it's more a consequence of more marketing dollar and more sort of popular topics. I don't want to take ownership of everything. Satisfaction, it has increased. So I told you before that we've had, um, we have generally high satisfaction for our museum. We use a five-point scale, which I don't like a five-point scale. I think seven-point scales are better, but the museum was previously using that scale, so I would want to keep the same scale so that we can compare. And uh, the average sort of level of satisfaction before was 4.4. Um, We're now at 4.7, almost 4.8 with the last three exhibition out of five. So this is, um, you know, it's, it's constantly, it, 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 it has increased. Um, the third is the learning outcomes. So we started um, testing learning outcomes for exhibitions even before they kind of really formally existed or were identified by the visitors. Um, we, you know, the exhibition in the previous model, when we started doing exhibition, we went to the curator evaluation. We went to the curator and said, "Okay, what were the most important thing you wanted to say?" And then we tested against them, and we had percentages of responses: 40, 50 percent uh, people people caught some of the themes. Now we're seeing more 90 percent <laughs> or 80 percent of the outcomes being met, which because it's everything is a lot more deliberate than before. You know, it's a lot more planned and carefully placed and carefully overlapped sometimes. So the messages are communicated more effectively. The last exhibition that we did an evaluation on had almost every outcome in above 50%, which is kind of incredible because um, some of them are less important than others. You know, they don't have all the same priority for us, but um, this was really, really, really positive. So these are kind of the way we measure it. Um, in terms of future, I mean, uh, well, for us, we need to fine-tune the model. Internally, the future is in the next couple of years, we need to um, fine-tune, we need to adjust a few things. The process is a little time-consuming, so we need to look into, is there any way that we can kind of you know, make it a little bit more simple? Where are the meetings necessary? Where are not the meetings necessary? What works? What doesn't? So we need to fine-tune it a little bit, and we need to, to spread it also to other exhibitions. At the moment, we only do it for our paid exhibition, so we, um, but we need a little bit more resources to be able to apply it also to other smaller exhibitions that are not paid or smaller rotations. So for us, we are invested in it and we want to um, continue doing it um, and kind of refine it. I don't think we are fully, like it's not perfect yet. We just need to fine tune it. And um, my hope, and when I go out there, I see more and more people, you know, we have a position opening, for instance, at the, um, at the moment in my department. And um, it's so funny, I received a lot of application from people that work in other mu art museums that do use similar system. You know, they have a team, they have outcomes. So, you know, it's good to see that other museums are kind of, you know, going in that direction. I don't think our museum have any choice. You know, if you want to continue to be relevant to, uh, to the community, that's, you know, that's, we need to be more minded of who we're developing these things for. Mm -hmm. That's just, I don't think there's any choice. Okay, okay thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce very quickly, uh, we have 10 minutes left, very quickly the um, uh, Carlo Zauli Museum and then we have another couple of questions related to this museum in particular. Um, mm -hmm. So the Carlo Zauli Museum is a contemporary art museum in Faenza. Uh, they have a particular focus on ceramic, which is uh, a material that is really rooted in the local tradition. And the museum is a uh, working shop um, named after um, Carlo Zauli, which is a 20th century um, sculptor. Um, and the space of the museum is structured mainly around the figure of this artist. Uh, under the direction of the son of the artist, the museum has become a very lively space. So they do mm -hmm. also events, uh, lectures, uh, they have artists in residence programs, uh, and also courses. Um, 
So the museum work with the contemporary artists as well. Um, they have a strong relation with the with the locality, with the local artists in particular um, that they try to involve to different extents. Um, they are interested in, in developing approaches that are innovative uh, for um, for different reasons. So on. We were talking with uh, Christine about the fact that Faenza is not really a touristic destination, although it's really lively um, and um, there is a uh, strong artist community. But uh, we were saying before that if it's in Milan, it's easier to develop like initiatives around that. But it's still a relatively small town, so it's kind of difficult to uh, let this community grow. Um, so they have to 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 think about new approaches to remain relevant and especially with their own community and the people that live in the city. So um, I think, Alessandro, you want to take it from here with the question? Yes. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, you know how difficult can be the situation in Italy. As Valeria said, not only for the scarcity of found but also uh, lack of mind of mindset toward the innovation. If a museum like uh, Carlo Zauli uh, needs to choose between keep going on as it is in a traditional way, let's say, or changing and maybe risking to fail, what you what would you say is the best way to go? Oh God, um, I think they're. They see, it seems to me that they're doing a lot of good things already. So I think they are. are you know, I don't. I don't think that you know. Could, I think I don't think continuing the way that they're doing is necessarily a bad thing. Um, I had a look at their website, and they seem to have a lot of different initiatives that you know um, are really focused on the community. So I think they are already doing good things. Um, I don't really, you know. So I think there's just maybe pushing it a little harder. Um, I don't think that people should be safe. I think that people should kind of try things. Uh, things are not as scary or as, you know, it's not, I don't think any of the things that we're doing here are going to kind of, you know, I don't know, just have consequence that if they don't work, it's like, oh my god, we never can go back to what we were before. You know, they can still try and if it doesn't work, they can continue doing what they were doing before. But I think that, um, um, I think it's just taking it to the next level, you know, bring it up a notch maybe a little bit, if, if possible. And there are ways, I mean, one of the struggles that um, museums have in Italy and, and you know, believe, believe me or not, even even here in smaller museums is obviously funding and, you know, how can we kind of, kind of, how can we do innovative things? We don't have a lot of people working in the museums. We don't have a lot of resources. Um, what can we do? And then um, one aspect of it and um, um, that does not require a lot of money and a lot of um, maybe time yes so um, but you can find ways of getting help for little costs there and um, is research is evaluation um, you know sometimes it's as easy as just finding three four hours one day to go out and talk to your visitors um, you know just to test an idea with the visitors that has that doesn't cost anything if you want to provide a little incentive um, to like for instance a little you know gift from the shop that as that probably is as much as it's going to cost you so research is, and evaluations is not something that really is very expensive when I first came here two and a half years ago we have no budget for it we had zero budget and fundamentally in the first year we were able to do quite a lot of things with probably five hundred dollars we got the Survey Monkey uh, subscription. That's two hundred and fifty dollars, and that was the money best was well spent in probably my entire life. And then we put, we purchased a little bit of you know gifts and stuff that we could um, you know give people to kind of thank them for the participation. And we were able to do a number of studies. Uh, another way to do it very cheaply and usefully is to use students. I don't know if Fenza or you have a university nearby. But we work a lot with, we have a museum study program here in, in Indianapolis, and so we, um, we work with the, the professors uh, that teaches them, um, audience research and evaluation in the program, and they send us every year one group of students that do one research project for us. We also recruit this 
students at the end of the year for being our data collector. So all of the all of the students, all of the people who do data collection here are students from the program. Um, you know, they're interested in starting in a museum, so you offer them a possibility to do that. And so they they're interested in in doing that. So partnership with the, with local schools and universities for data collection. Um, that's something that that you that you can you could do. And then you know. You could do more sophisticated analysis, and that costs more money. But I think the important thing is to start with something. Uh, you know, uh, a paper survey to your audience. Uh, you know, if you do any any survey with the visitors that come to your events, to your programs, to the galleries. But it's we have a we have a survey. I mean, we collected using iPads, but you can do a little paper survey. It costs you the money of the photocopies, <laughs> and um, you know, and then SurveyMonkey will allow you to do some basic analysis. So you enter the data in SurveyMonkey, and then it allows you to do a little analysis. Um, for more sophisticated analysis, we use a different software, but for the purpose that you need at the beginning, SurveyMonkey will serve your purpose. So that's kind of um, one way to um, to certainly um, you know uh, do something relatively cheaply. Okay. Okay. And thank uh, you. I have another question uh, related to also what were you saying before that the curators are a little bit scared about mm -hmm. uh, this new approach. You know how um, in Italy is much more the role of the curator is much more important. Like in a way, like the expert that. Uh, published books and the research is it's a really uh, relevant tool and it's really important uh, how do you feel um, how do you think that a museum like the Carlo Zoli but any museum in Italy could um, explain their curators that there's nothing to be scared of and try to what's the best approach to to explain to them that it's their role is not it's not that other people are gonna take over their role it's just a different way of uh, organizing the workflow and everything I think do it is the best way to explain it because they will see that fundamentally we still respect the artwork. You know, we still think that fundamentally at the end of the day the artwork is the most important thing and whatever we do, we still are respectful of that. And we could not have explained that to them in any other way but showing them. So there's a couple of important things to consider. First thing, number one, is support from the upper management. You know, you're not going to implement this vision, this perspective, if you don't have the director in the museum and the deputy director that are absolutely in favor of this idea. Because in moments of tension, you will have to escalate it up, and they will have to say, no, this is how we're going to do it. You know, that is, you know, one reality. You need to have the support of the upper management. The other way to kind of start getting them to see what you are talking about um, and um, make them look like they're not so, you know, it's not so scary, <laughs> is to take ownership of one space. Let's start with one space in the museum. You know, we started with one gallery, a gallery that, um, because it was, um, it was a gallery that because of the sponsorship agreement with the donors, it had to have a technology component in it. So we take, took ownership of that gallery and started kind of work with curators to come up with ideas for, um, uh, you know, um, showing the art, but also, you know, doing interpretation in a slightly different way, using technology. We involved them in this project, so obviously, because we didn't want to do it without them. And they started kind of feeling, oh, it's not that bad. And then you do evaluation and you show them that people are actually engaging with the works of art longer. They know more information. Uh -huh. They and so they start feeling a little bit more comfortable with it. So I would say, yeah, support from up and management, and then start with something. Start with one space, you know, and then work from then, and then expand it to the other space. Like this is my problem now. Just to give you an example, I started with one space. Then now I have exhibitions, and my next step is okay. I want to take this approach to the permanent collection. So I'm going to have to, you know, at the moment I do it in exhibition. I do it in little space that I have ownership of, but still curators have not let me into the permanent collection. So my next big challenge is to, you know, do take that step. And I have all the data that proves that what we've done in the exhibition is successful, so they, you know, then you kind of, they start becoming more comfortable with it because they do see the results and they see the positive um, effect of, of, of that. Okay. Um, and in terms of workload, do you think that... Um for curators in particular, for, for every, everybody, uh, do you think that this approach 
put some constraint in that sense? Like, it, there is more work to do in terms of. There is. There is more content to create. You know, you we there is a lot more than than before because we use more tools to 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 talk about things. Um, there is more content. Um, it is a very different mindset for them. Curators are very um, detailed oriented people. They really go, and it's it's a positive thing. I I you know it's it's really something that I it's a skill that I don't have. Uh, you know I'm more of a bigger picture person, multitasker, and I don't have the chance to go very much into detail into something because I have to juggle more things at the same time. Um, so curators are, they work 10 years on an exhibition. The exhibition that we have now, the curator has been spending the last 10 years to work on. And you, so they have a, such a focus on it and know the detail upside down and that makes it very difficult for them to multitask. So um, this is one of the biggest challenge of turning them into you know multitasker because we need the con we need they are the expert I'm not writing the content I am reviewing it but I'm not writing it and I you know and um, I don't come up with you know the concepts and the ideas we kind of work together but it comes from them so the challenge of kind of let them kind of be less zoned zoned in but a little bit more multitasking is I think it's very difficult because that's how they how they are used to operate so. This is really the challenge, but you know they're getting used to it. The, the secret that we have to help in that process is that we start the processes very, very much in advance. We start the development of exhibition this process one and a half year in advance, so that you know they still have the time to come up with the content, to to see the details, but also kind of produce multiple things. So not just an exhibition in six months, but something that you takes a year and a half to to kind of prepare, so that they do have the time to kind of adjust a little bit. <laughs> They're getting better and faster. I have to be I have to be honest with you. The turnaround is getting is getting quicker, and some of them are better at that, and some others are not. And you know you have to work with it. <laughs> No sound. I think we are done. Okay, can you okay. hear me now? Um, any other questions? Uh, one, two, three. No. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia, for this. It was really interesting. And um, thank you, Christina, for joining us. And thank you all. And we're going to see um, the next appointment with the uh, Svegliamo Museo on Air is this uh, coming Wednesday on uh, staff training in the digital age, age with uh, Ed Rodley. So stay tuned. Say hi uh, to Ed. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Uh, OK, bye. 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 bye.